Hello, I am Dr. Steve Johnson, and welcome to a quick introduction to RABT. This model, this very powerful model, was established by Dr. Albert Ellis, and he credits the in part the development of the model to the influence of early Greek philosophy, particularly the philosophy of the Stoics, and among them Epictetus and uh, Marcus Aurelius, who really essentially said that men are not disturbed by events, but by the views they take of them. And this is the heart of REBT. I'd like to begin with a discussion of the basic ABC model that is so primary to rational emotive behavior therapy. In the ABC model, let's look at what each of those letters stand for. The A stands for, well, a number of things uh, have, or terms have been used over the years. One is activating event, which is the one we tend to use now, but many people also use the word adversity. And the activating event would, of course, be the situation that occurs about which the individual is disturbed. In more recent years, we focused on also what we call the critical activating event. That would be that part of the activating event that is most relevant to the uh, disturbance. So when we, for example, if a client comes in and they are angry because they've just been fired, and so we would say that the activating event might be getting fired. But if I ask the client the question, what was most significant in getting fired to you being angry? And, you know, the client might say, well, it was just this uh, condescending and dismissive way that my boss uh, told me about it. And, uh, and so we would call that part of the activating event, the critical activating event. And it's really important that we to the degree that we can determine the critical activating event because in the treatment, we, and actually in the assessment too, the critical activating event will be most relevant to um, the consequences of that. And while I'm talking about consequences, that's what the letter C stands for. And the consequences are emotions, behaviors, and even physiological responses. Many people would say that those are caused by the the activating event, but we'll see in a minute that is not REBT's uh, uh, approach to to this. So, the uh, knowing the critical activating event will help elicit more of the motion in the session, so that it's easy for us to do an assessment and develop a, a treatment plan and know what to um, what to do in uh, the treatment. Now let's go to the B. The B stands for beliefs. Some people use the word attitude for beliefs. Under that umbrella, general umbrella, we would include inferences. There, in REBT, we have stipulative definitions for inferences and beliefs. There, that we, of course, both are cognitions, but we separate those. Inferences are those cognitions about a, an event that attributes meaning to the event or interprets the event. So the inference gives us the meaning or inference that the client has attributed to the activating or critical activating event. The beliefs, on the other hand, are not the attribution of meaning or an interpretation of the event. They are an evaluation of the event, maybe in terms of goodness, badness, etc., that we will see in just a minute. An REBT looks at beliefs in terms of whether they're functional or dysfunctional beliefs. And the difference between functional beliefs and dysfunctional beliefs are that the functional beliefs help us attain our life goals, our desired life goals, and and to uh, fulfill our values that we that we have. Whereas the dysfunctional beliefs do the opposite. They may tend to sabotage us in reaching the goals and maybe not fulfilling those those values that we may have. 
And in REBT, we have just a handful of, of what we would call these dysfunctional beliefs. And the primary, or what we sometimes call the core dysfunctional belief, is demandingness, which in English is evidenced in sentences that use the words should, ought, must, have to, or need. Now, we don't pounce on the client when they use those words. It's not the words that we're concerned about. It is the meaning of the words and how the client is attributing meaning there. So it's always important to assess whether there's actually a demand or they're just using the word as a, just a common phrase that may be used in the society, right? Like I say, oh, I've got to get that done. Well, that may not be a demand upon the self. It just may be the way that we talk. In addition to that, the demandingness, which it really is the core, there are added to those what we call derivatives, other dysfunctional beliefs, and they really fall into three, three different types. One is awfulizing about an event, believing over a period of time that uh, something is terrible, horrible, or awful, or as bad as it could be. Another one is frustration intolerance, which is evidence in words like this is too much, um, you know, I can't stand this, uh, this will be the death of me, uh, you know, those kinds of uh, statements, frustration intolerance. And the third is a really important kind of dysfunctional belief, and that is global negative rating. And uh, that can be global negative rating of the self, like I'm a loser, I'm no good, I'm worthless, I'm nothing but a failure. Or it could be a global neg ra negative rating of others. They're no good. They're utterly unreliable. They're, you know, worthless. Or a global negative rating of life or the world or even ne uh, any other thing, you know. So those are the major ones, a global negative rating of self, others, life, world, and so forth. Now, in REBT, among the A, B, and C, especially when we're interacting with the client, we focus on what we call the BC connection. We're trying to help the client realize that beliefs are direct causes of consequences, emotions, behaviors, and physiological responses and not so much the event. Because most people, in some therapies even, will say, how did that make you feel? How did that event make you feel? Which kind of reinforces that the event is the cause of our emotions, behaviors, and physiological responses. But it's not so much the event. Of course, the event is relevant. If the event didn't occur, we wouldn't have those particular consequences. But it, the direct cause would be more the beliefs that we have or the evaluations that we're making about events that we have interpreted with meaning. So the other thing about uh, the BC connection is if we put that in the context of the A, B, and C, we do want people to realize, and there's a tendency when they hear about the ABC model to think that it's purely linear, that that the activating event just triggers the belief and the beliefs directly cause the uh, consequences. Uh, but that's not quite right. In uh, I mean, it's pedagogically easier to explain it to clients in that way. Sometimes it's easier to grasp. But actually, REBT holds that the A, the B, and the C are all interconnected, which is actually quite good news because that means changes in the A may cause changes in the B and C. So, for example, if somebody's worried about, uh, has anxiety about money, and then suddenly they inherit a few million dollars, well, the A changed, and so the anxiety may go away. So the A is relevant, right? Um, changing the B will change the A and the C, or changing the concept, change the emotion, may change the um, the, the beliefs, and then the um, the uh, what counts as an activating event may change. And so, beliefs, emotions, behaviors are all interconnected, and so changes in one will be ch cause a change in uh, the others. If we move to um, consequences and beliefs, that's a really important issue. So, and let's focus in on emotions and look at how REB2 looks at emotions. First, 
we would say that there are positive emotions and negative emotions. Positive emotions are those emotions that feel good and we all want. Whereas negative emotions don't feel good. Things like anxiety, depression, rage, hurt, guilt, you know, all of those are negative emotions. And it, the goals in REB, REBT will not necessarily be to try to attain positive emotions instead of negative emotions, because we have another categorization of those emotions, and those would be functional versus dysfunctional emotions. And the difference between a functional emotion and a dysfunctional emotion is not the same as positive and negative. A functional emotion is one that helps us to attain our goals and fulfill our values. Whereas a dysfunctional emotion, as I said, will do just the opposite. It will have a tendency to dis to sabotage our attainment of the goals and fulfill and get fulfillment of those uh, those values. And we focus on the functionality or the dysfunctionality of the emotion because a positive emotion may actually be dysfunctional and a functional and a negative emotion might be quite functional. Let me give you an example. Let's say I'm a parent and I have a child with a hundred and three degree Fahrenheit temperature and um, I need to take action to get that temperature down so it may not do any harm to my child. If I'm happy, then um, it may sabotage me taking action to get it down. In fact, that is kind of neglect or abuse of the child to do that. So a positive emotion in that kind of situation would not be functional. Whereas high anxiety would be also dysfunctional because the person might be so anxious that they cannot focus and think straight to actually help get the child's temperature down. But if they had concern, which is a negative emotion, nobody likes to go around feeling concerned, but it's a functional negative emotion. We can be concerned and take action maybe to get that temperature down. So you see the positive emotion, happiness, would be dysfunctional and the negative emotion, anxiety, would be dysfunctional, but the negative emotion concern could be um, could be functional in this case. The other thing to remember is that REBT believes that the difference between functional and dysfunctional emotions is a difference in kind. It's not in terms of intensity. So for example, if we take a dysfunctional emotion like we just saw anxiety and we dial down the intensity of it, that that would create concern. No, these are qualitatively different emotions and the difference is, the qualitative difference is that the dysfunctional emotions tend to sabotage us in attaining goals, whereas the functional emotions tend to help us to attain those goals. So you see that's a qualitative difference and not a quantitative difference of the intensity of the emotion. We can have a helpful negative emotion, a functional negative emotion that is really, really intense. I may be very concerned about something, but not anxious. And so while that concern is intense, I'm still able to um, to function. Now, REBT in talking about emotions does have an ideal vocabulary. That's just to make it easy for the therapist and the client to be on the same page when they're discussing what the client is feeling, the emotion experience. And in this ideal vocabulary, the dysfunctional emotion, let me give some examples. A dysfunctional emotion would be anxiety. The functional alternative emotion to anxiety is concern. Depression would be used as a dysfunctional emotion, whereas sadness would be the functional alternative. And remember, this is not dialing down depression to make sadness. They're qualitative differences in terms of the degree to which they are helping or harming or impeding the attainment of goals. Anger would be a dysfunctional emotion. Some people would say unhealthy anger is the dysfunctional emotion. And the functional alternative to it might be annoyance. Uh, some people find that a little bit anemic of a term. And one that is really popular now is functional anger. And one that many of us in REVT like is righteous indignation. Okay, And that would be the functional alternative to the unhelpful anger. An unhel another unhelpful emotion would be hurt. And the functional 
uh, alternative to that would be uh, disappointment. And then common one, a dysfunctional emotion would be guilt. And the functional alternative to that would be remorse. If we look at inferences and beliefs with respect to the emotions, REBT would hold that inferences uh, do ha have a uh, have a causal relationship to to emotions, but it's more of a distant cause. It's kind of setting the stage for the emotions, those inferences. But then the beliefs or the evaluation of the situation is more the direct cause of the emotions and uh, behaviors, whether functional or uh, dysfunctional. And let's look at behaviors. In REBT, behaviors are also divided into functional or dysfunctional, and, and the criteria is the same thing. Does that behavior impede the attainment of goals and the attainment of values, or does it help? So functional would help, and dysfunctional would uh, tend to uh, impede. Now, in this introduction to REBT, I think one of the most important, important concepts and actually important skills uh, associated with this really need to be learned. That is the conceptualization of emotion. And it is really important to, to study that. In At the Albert Ellis Institute, the lecture on the second day in the primary uh, practicum in REBT focuses on the conceptualization of emotion because it is so important to uh, understand the dysfunction of the client but also it helps us set forth a treatment plan. So let's just jump into the conceptualization of emotion. Of course, we need to determine what the critical activating event is, but then we also identify the inferences. And remember, the inferences are the meanings that the client gives to the, um, to the activating event or critical activating event or the interpretation of that event. And every emotion has like a different inference or different inferences. For example, in anxiety, the inference that the client has is that there is a threat, a threat to the self. It could be a threat to life itself or a threat to one's comfort or uh, self-esteem, those kinds of things. In depression, the inference, the meaning attributed to the situation or the interpretation of the situation is that there's been a significant loss, such as the death of an individual or the loss of health or the loss of a job or of an important relationship, etc. Anger, the, uh, the inferences tend to be that the client infers that there's been a violation of ethical principle, one that's, or a principle that is very important to the individual. So, for example, many people get angry when they have an inference of that uh, the principle of justice has been violated, okay? And then uh, after we get the inferences for each of those different emotions, then we look at the beliefs, and these are important, and, and because, uh, and then we will determine whether there's a functional um, emotion or dysfunctional alternative emotion that is the direct cause of those beliefs. Now, one thing to keep in mind, is that for a given emotion, say anxiety, the inference will be the same for anxiety, which is the dysfunctional emotion, or for concern, the functional emotion. When one has anxiety or one has concern, the inference is going to be the same. There's a threat to the self or one's comfort. The beliefs, however, are different for anxiety than they are for concern. So, for example, let's say I'm taking, uh, I'm anxious about a final exam. I'm a student. I'm anxious about the final exam. And the anxiety would be the, um, you know, the dis, uh, dysfunctional uh, emotion. The inference is that there's a threat. I'm, you know, that uh, I might fail, etc., and that that would, you know, that would be awful. And 
And um, so the inference is that there's a threat. The beliefs are that I must not fail. That would be terrible if I failed. It would be horrible if I failed. Those kinds of beliefs. With concern, there would be the same inference that there's a threat, right? Fail, and that would be, you know, that, that would be a threat to me attaining a, a goal. And so the beliefs would be quite different. Instead of saying it must not happen, we've got, you know, I, I hope this doesn't happen. I hope I don't threat. But if it does, you know, it's not the end of the world. They wouldn't engage in the awfulizing. Yeah, again, I don't like it, but it's not awful. Yeah, of course, I, I wouldn't like it, but I could stand it. And that wouldn't mean that I'm, you know, I'm a failure. It wouldn't mean that Professor was a horrible human being for creating that exam. And life isn't worthless and the world isn't horrible if I um if I don't pass this exam. So you see the beliefs around that inference, the inference of a threat, and the threat is the same for both, but the beliefs are different. And so that is clearly showing that the um, beliefs are more directly relevant to the, um, to the emotion. So in the conceptualization of emotion, of course, we know what the event is. We will determine what the inference is for the specific emotion. We will determine the functional or dysfunctional, excuse me, functional or dysfunctional beliefs. And then the last thing we want to assess is the action or behavioral potential. So each of those emotions will have an action potential associated with or a behavioral potential. So, for, so for example, anxiety's associated action potential is avoidance. Think about it. When you are anxious, you tend to avoid things. Whereas if I'm concerned, I won't gauge in, in avoidance. I may not like, you know, approaching whatever the event is, but I'm not going to engage in the avoidance. So that would be the associated action potential. For depression, the action potential is not so much avoidance as it is withdrawing from life, withdrawing uh, from those things that were normally pleasurable, you know, when uh, the individual was not depressed. Or for example, in guilt, the action potential might be more um, self uh, self punishment. After we get the conceptualization of emotions, then we can, and I'll talk about this in a few minutes. What we gather there will be tremendously helpful in coming up with a treatment plan. So before I get there, I want to look at then. Let's say I have the, I've gotten the critical activating event, I know what the inference is, I know what the beliefs are, I know what the action potential is, and then I can begin like doing the interventions, uh, you know, to help the individual attain more functional emotions or functional behaviors. So there are different kinds of interventions we use in rational emotive behavior therapy, cognitive interventions, behavioral interventions, emotive interventions, etc. So in cognitive interventions, what we do is we identify the dysfunctional beliefs, we dispute them and, and try to replace them. And we'll do that with the unhelpful um, uh, unhelpful inferences uh, too, but we do uh, them in a little bit different way. So if I focus on the beliefs, then I might uh, use a, one cognitive approach would be to use a Socratic method. So for example, if the client's irrational beliefs is, I must not fail this final exam, the Socratic approach might be, and how is it helpful for you to tell yourself that you must not fail? So we're asking a question, and that is really helpful because it gets more engagement from the client. But some clients may have trouble with that Socratic approach at times, and so we can use more a didactic approach. So for example, some people in in your situation or experiencing this similar kind of activating event might be saying that, you know, that it would be horrible to, to fail the final exam. But the result of that tends to be that it saps the energy from them that they could put into studying. Are you experiencing any of that? So you see, 
it's more teaching, it's uh, more didactic. Or there's another one called the friendship. Uh, there are numerous ones, but I'm just going to cover in one more. The friendship dispute. Let's say you had a friend in that situation who was saying that they are a, they'll be a failure if they fail the exam. Would you say, yes, you're right? Well, of course, we wouldn't say such a thing, you know, or if it's really a friend, we won't do that. And so it's kind of like, okay, if you wouldn't say it for, to a friend, why are you telling yourself that? So you see what, and then you can tie that to maybe what are you getting out of it then? So, so those would be kind of cognitive approaches to help the individual attain functional emotions or behaviors. There can be behavioral interventions. So for example, if I have the anxious client, I might have them act against their avoidance because the behavioral potential with anxiety is avoidance. So I may give them some things to do collaboratively. We might identify some things that we could do so that they act differently rather than avoidance. They're more um, uh, approach rather than avoidance. And then we can see whether that helps get some um, more functional emotions. So let me go back to why it is so important to do a thorough conceptualization of emotion with the client. Well, primarily because this helps with the treatment plan. For example, once we know the inference, we can change or help the client change the meaning or the interpretation they're giving to the event. The, because often the inference they hold to very tightly and they are very rigid about it. And so we might want to help look at alternative interpretations or alternative meanings or help them realize they're the one that's giving the meaning. The meaning is not in the situation. They're interpreting the event to mean a particular thing. So um, th knowing that inference may help us to address the level of meaning, which is important. So for example, in anxiety, what we might want to do at the level of inference is help them move from seeing the event as a threat only or an overwhelming threat to you know, be realistic and uh, acknowledge that there is a threat, but there is also opportunity. And so if they can begin to see that there is opportunity, then they may change behavior into moving into the opportunity while they're um, experiencing the threat. Now, once we know the beliefs, which we do in the conceptualization of emotion, then we work in the ways that I've just talked about to do cognitive restructuring, identify, dispute, and, and replace the uh, dysfunctional, dysfunctional belief. And if we do that, that would change the evaluations that the client's giving to, to particular events rather than thinking it's horrible and that they can't stand it, then they realize that, yeah, it, it, it may not be good. You know, we're not going to pretend that it's fantastic. It may not be good, but it's not utterly the end of the world. And there are some things that I can do, which leads to the next one. In the conceptualization of emotion, since we've identified the behavioral potential, then we can develop behavioral interventions there, right? So for anxiety, I might do exposure interventions to get them to, you know, to act into an alternative um, action rather than avoidance. And in fact, for some conditions such as depression and anxiety, starting with a behavioral intervention may be a little easier and give us some more little wiggle room uh, and th uh, psychotherapeutically. And then once um, the individual is less depressed, you know, or they're moving in a, in a better direction with depression or anxiety, then they may have the better presence to do the, uh, the cognitive. Albert Ellis said, sometimes it's easier to act your way into uh, an emotion than uh, feel your way into a new action. So I think that is, um, you know, a good thing to keep in mind. And then the other thing is it also... Uh, cognitive conceptual, I mean, the uh, emotional conceptualization helps us to identify what goal we might want to attain. So if the client is really anxious because they are attributing a threat in their environment, our goal might be to help move them toward concern. So let me end with looking at some other important things to do in this, in REBT and as part of this introduction. 
One thing to remember is we REBT therapists are not overly directive. We are certainly not dictatorial. We don't tell the client what to do. We collaborate with the client to discern a helpful goal, something that would help them attain their desired life um, values, right? And those goals we need to be uh, realistic about. One of the goals that clients sometimes come up with is not really helpful. And I think um, our friends in acceptance and commitment therapy really point this out quite well, is um, it's not really tenable to have a desire to feel nothing. I mean, to wish away all feeling. Um, That is kind of to wish away life. In fact, some people call that the dead man's goal because the best way to feel nothing is to be dead. Well, that's kind of extreme. We want our help, our client to experience, you know, both positive and functional negative emotions. So we'll try to come up with a goal that's more realistic than to feel nothing. Or the goal might be to um, to jump to a positive emotion when often that may not be functional or it may not be realistic. So for example, if I'm very depressed and my I say my goal is to be uh, is to be happy, uh, yeah, that may be something uh, down the road to attain, but we need to help the client see that that this is a process. And one of the things that we may do is move from depression to sadness, where they'll be much more functional in life, and then perhaps later on attain happiness. Unless, you know, they're really going through a negative, really negative event, and then experiencing happiness in the face of a really negative event, event may not be the most realistic or even functional goals. The other one is the goal, they may say, well, I want, my goal is to be less anxious. And so remember, we view emotions and separate emotions, not in terms of intensity, but in terms of kind. So we wouldn't want just to decrease the intensity of the anxiety, although that may be part of the process that um, helps us move away from anxiety to help the client embrace a more functional negative emotion such as uh, such as uh, concern. And the other thing to think about when trying to work out uh, goals with clients is um, really, it was the work of Emmons that really helped me to see this. And he said that it's really helpful if we have a positive goal or an approach goal rather than an avoidance goal. So if the client says their goal is to avoid getting anxious rather than to move toward concern rather than anxiety, to avoid feeling anxious is far more complicated because they have to, the client would have to anticipate all the potential ways that they might become anxious and then have a plan to avoid all of those. Whereas if we have a more approach goal, like to become concerned, all the client would need to do is find one way to do that, right? So it is, I guess I could use the word simpler, I mean, not as complicated if we have an approach goal, a positive goal, rather than an avoidance goal. We want to avoid something. So if we can help the client state their avoidance goal as more of an approach or a positive goal, that can be much more helpful. Well, I hope this introduction to REBT was helpful. And always for more training around this, you might consider uh, taking a look at the uh, website of the Albert Ellis Institute and the many trainings that they have, such as the primary practicum certificate training. And then once you do that, you could do the advanced and there are specialized ones such as child and adolescent um, practicum too, or there are special workshops on particular conditions such as anxiety or personality disorders or depression, etc. So thank you so much. Again, I hope you found this helpful and have a wonderful day.